Hello, I uh, was in need to calibrate this instrument. It's an HP 8116. It's, uh, it's a classic from HP. Uh, function generator, 50 megahertz. It can do sine, triangle, uh, no pulse, pulse generator. It's no, the 8112, I guess, or is the uh, pulse generator. And this one is the one that has all the functions in it. Uh, it's uh, digital. Um, and uh, the levels is adjustable, both either in amplitude or high and low level, so you know, can be triggered externally. Good all round instrument, um, compact, maybe not my favorite, but packs a lot in the small volume, some would say too small. You'll see inside it's super packed. Um, and these are hard to repair if you get one that doesn't work and if it's one of the special hybrid that's in there you are kind of out of luck so they are just at the border where they become somewhat impossible to repair if it's not something simple it works but the frequency is off and figure that when uh, um, we, we, we try to uh, use it for the cesium clock back there we need to measure the Zeeman line and we need a generator for that and it was quite off so while we're at, while I'm at it, uh, let me turn it off and show you. Uh, I already took the, the screws off, so this goes away from the back. Then there's just one screw at the bottom. Can't remember where over here. Oh, I put it the wrong way. This was at the back, so I just slide it on the wrong way. But one screw at the bottom, and off you go. So today we are going to relax from the previous brainy cesium clock and quantum physics video. We are gonna play technician and bring this wayward instrument back in spec according to the HP instructions and actually learn a thing or two while we are at it. But it shouldn't be too hard on the noggin and hopefully will help other people that have this popular instrument. This one I think was uh, designed in Germany if I'm not uh, mistaken. And then it's interesting, it's so packed to get to the adjustment, you have to take the bores off, I already took the screws off, and put them on the side. And then you take the shield out somehow. There you go. And there's another board underneath, and I think you repeat the same thing. Uh, by the way, uh, they were some rubber feet that melted away, so I already cleaned up the mess. Uh, probably this instrument was uh, stored sideways and it all melted down over here, so there's plenty of it all over the place, so I have to replace the, the feet. This is fairly annoying, I have to say. Mr. Shoehorn was hard at work, and, 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 and you know why, because this, this started as an instrument that had less capability, which was the 8112, just a pulser, and they mm, filled it up with more capability. I don't know if you can see, but there's so little space to take the board out that they had to make cutouts right here so the board can be lifted up. There, it looks like a Star Wars spaceship. And in there, you can see the hybrid circuit, the little troublemakers. That's where most of the detour stuff happens. And uh, you know, if one of those bad, basically you are hosed. You have to go to one of the sellers on eBay that has it, and they know it's valuable, though, so they rip you off, and it's basically almost not worth it to repair these things. And the manual is available, sort of, kind of. Um, you have to get it from Artec Media, uh, which is actually of all the people that uh, sell scans. These guys actually have the an arrangement for the copyright of it, so that's legit, and they are very reasonably priced and it's you no know, maybe nine bucks to get the, the the whole thing and it's very very well scanned and the first thing you have to do is get the uh, power supplies calibrated which is of course easy peasy stuff and at least for power they made it easy to check for you you can see all the test point ground and all the voltages are shown here so that shouldn't be too hard the power adjustments are hidden 
back here. Somewhere down here. Oh yeah, I can see them. Oh my goodness, this is so tight. I need to get a insulated screwdriver. Well, 15 volts seems right on. I might not have to adjust anything. I did adjust it anyhow just to loosen the wipers a little bit. Okay, my 5.2 is a little bit off and it's just once again it's buried. My goodness, Hans, what did you do? Okay, 5.25 and that's plus minus 10 millivolts. So you need a really good meter. And the plus 5 volt is the same pot. Minus 5.2 and plus 5 volt are of the same thing. So I cannot get them all good at the same time. What do I do? And the spec is 5.050 plus minus 50 millivolts. So I'll put it as close to 5 as possible. Something like that. So I definitely have a problem here. My minus 5.2 is off when my 5.0 is good. Okay, so the 5.2 being the tightest spec, I'll adjust it for that. And I suppose the 5.0 is for the logic. I hope. Minus 5.250 plus minus 10. Okay. Do like that. 24 is good. I'll still move it so so the the wiper doesn't stick. All right. Consider that good. And finally, minus 15, which is good too. So okay. So the next step and the first measurement I'm a little bit stumped because it says to adjust the instrument for a square wave 100 kilohertz 50 duty cycle zero offset 16 volts and which I have done so so the this is one one of the nice thing about this instruments the amplitude is digitally adjustable and so is the offset Oh, it's offset, offset, so I know it's at zero, but you can have any millivolt offset you like. And when I'm adjusted at 16 volt, which is a max, uh, probably one of the max amplitude you can do, I am getting a reading of 32.6. So do they mean half amplitude? Yes, because it cannot be that that far off. I finally figured out my amplitude discrepancy. It's because all the measurements were referred as to f into 50 ohms, which of course my scope cannot take uh, 16 volts at 50 ohms, so I have to put two attenuators. And uh, so now when it says 16 volts, this is what I'm getting. So that's what the problem was, is that I was uh, basically measuring into one mega ohm then there's a gajillion pots that you have to adjust and you're told which one that is and there's one for every darn thing in this instrument and you basically have to adjust the amplitude and zero offset separately for square triangle and sinusoid waveforms an annoying total of six pots and this is all done by watching the scope, so your scope better be calibrated to start with. Oh no, after you have done it all for amplitude, you need to read the weight for low amplitude. My goodness. So now we're good. We are in 50 ohms with 20 dB attenuation. I've put the ratio of 10 to 1 because 20 dB is 10 attenuation. And I was 16 volts in sign in triangle and in square wave phew we got it so here's a measurement we have to have a motor scope they tell you for the sinusoid to adjust the pot until you get the best sinusoid shape which is yeah somewhere 
that's no good, that's no good, hard to tell, but you just turn on on the motorscope, you turn the FFT, and I'm just going to minimize the harmonic distortion, and know right away, th this is my fundamental, and this is my second, this is my third harmonic, and here we go, Whoop. you can see the minimum of the third harmonic, there you go. And I bet you that is the best seen as which shape you can get. Alright. Viva le modern scope. And with the measurement in the 50 ohms of course reflections are attenuated so I'm much better in overshoot so now I can keep it within Less than six nanoseconds rise time and less than a few percent overshoot over the whole range. And it depends if you want to emphasize the low range or the high range. I want to give it a little bit more. It's, uh, it's a trade off, five volts. It's a little bit peaky at 16 volts, but you know, I'm not going to use it at 16 volts that often. So once you're done with all your amplitude and offset adjustments, then you have to go down to another setting I was not aware of. You have to go into, down to 1 kilohertz and make that beautiful thing look nice and flat. Is the low frequency adjustment spot and something like that and painfully we arrive at the VCO which is the one that's off. The next step necessitates the counter and it's sort of complicated. Down here to 1 kilohertz I am connected to the trigger output. On the other side it's an interesting setup here. It's time A to B. I am A. I am in common mode, so I'm, I have both the signals on A to B. I'm at 50 ohms, and I guess that's to avoid reflections over here. Uh, so I and I have the inverted slope on B. So basically, it triggers on A, and it stops on B, which should be adjusted to. 500 microsecond plus minus 0.5 so that's on the board over here somewhere okay I have to do a little printout of which one that, that is so here we go here's my printout so we want to nudge this fellow 500 microsecond and I'm fairly far off now, of course, if you don't have a counter, you would be able to do that on a scope. Dancing around, there you go. So we have that adjusted. All right. This is complicated. Next one, I have to go to 9.99 kilohertz. Why would you do that? I don't know. And I have to be 50 microseconds plus minus 0.5. Looks like I am there for once something is correct. See if we can make it even better. Oh, that would be good. Oh, and then I have to go back to 1 kilohertz. Gee wee. And... Yay, it has changed this one. So you have to go back and forth between the two. There we go. And now we go to 999. Oh, 50 microsecond. Exactly. All right. So now we have both correct. Excellent. And finally, has arrived the time where I measure frequency. So I go to frequency. All right, and I go to. What do they say? To, yeah, 9.99 megahertz. 
they don't like 10 megahertz for some reason. Yeah. 9.99 megahertz, and I am just freaking completely off. Which I knew. Okay. Pretty close. Then you want to go back to 1 megahertz. Oh, that's fairly far off. Oh, it's a VCO, that's why. Okay, so now I get it. This is... A I'm so used to the PLL control thing that are accurate to the last digits. This is basically a VCO, this is an analog control. So this is not as precise as I thought it would be. This is 9.99. And you want to be 9.99 plus minus 0.5 megahertz, so it's not very picky over here. <laughs> right, and then on 10 megahertz, it changes, it's a different control, and it's a different resistor that sets it. Really, really weird. Okay, so I'm back in calibration here. Moi, that was uh, very much more analog y than I expected in this instrument. I hadn't realized. It was uh, really a, an analog VCO, an analog everything, controlled by digital electronics, but the instrument in space is analog. And this is why I couldn't achieve the frequency precision that I expected. It doesn't advertise much, it advertises only three digits, so that, that, make, that makes sense. And, uh, but at least now it's not completely off as it used to be. And here, last touch, I'll put a piece of cork instead of the rubber that is integrated. Hopefully the cork will last for a longer time. And here's the result. This used to be all over the place. Now I asked for 50 kilohertz, one volt, and I get 49.956 kilohertz and 1.06 volt and then if I ask it for a one second pulse it tells you 1.00 and it actually no shows just gives you what it can give you it gives you two decimals 1.00 and then it's not a quartz based instrument it's just a completely analog so it can't expect and that much precision for it, which actually I didn't know. If I ask it for a 10 microsecond pulse, it's hopefully going to give me a 10.20 microsecond pulse. Well done, HP 8116.